These are the planes that won wars. Proud veterans of the days when heroes fought in the skies. They like time machines. It seems that you grab the controls, you've got that instant touch back to the past. In hangars and workshops across Britain, engineers and enthusiasts are fighting a desperate duel against corrosion. It's only glued on. I'm sure it'll be all right. And the clock. I'll be pretty gutted if we don't make it. Their mission? To return historic military aircraft to the skies. The hardest thing is finding the parts. From D-Day vets to jump jets. As a little lab, you go, mum, 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 can I have it in a fixed kit? Bloody fantastic. From legendary lifesavers to Edwardian flying machines. I've been told I can only fly it as high as I'm prepared to fall. But it can be an unpredictable business. If we have a catastrophic failure, then come and try and rescue us. You're taking off thinking, if the engine stops, we're even a land. I mean, I've had three engine failures. It takes serious money. You need a cool three to six million pounds to get a good spare part. And total dedication. Minus 28. Some of the tools are freezing up. 15 minutes of holding a screwdriver. You can't feel your fingers. This time on Warbird Workshop, the unique fighter. It's exceptionally rare being the only one on planet Earth at the current time. Being rebuilt by engineers determined to stop it being overshadowed. We don't really mention the Spitfire word in here. To return it to the sky, carrying the daughter of its wartime pilot. To go up in that hurricane will just be absolutely amazing. Why did your victory roll in your father's honor? The skies that were the backdrop of the Battle of Britain are dominated by tower blocks and passenger jets today. But on an airfield in southern England, one of the fighters that saved the nation in 1940 is being reborn. This is a, a Mark I Hurricane, um, and, uh, and like all of the Hurricanes at the moment, this is a single seat, and what we're going to do is we're going to put a second seat in the back. Uh, with a totally unique modification, which we'll be designing ourselves. Engineer Andrew Wenman and his team at Hawker Restorations are the world's leading experts in rebuilding the legendary Hurricane. This is what we specialise in, and we really do wholeheartedly believe that the Hurricane has earned its place in history and deserves to be out there being seen by members of the public. Andrew and Chief Engineer Peter Johnson have a deadline the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain in September 2020, just a year's time. And hitting it will take all the team's skills. So up there we have Graham. Anything there is to know about a hurricane, um, you ask Graham. 1,360 horsepower. We have Nick there, does a lot of the stripping down, a lot of the painting. Brian, he's our wingman. You've only got small access holes, so yeah, it's all torch and mirror stuff. And then there's Rich and Phil, and they work on systems, installing the engine, coolant, pneumatics, hydraulics, all of the plumbing side of it. We're all petrol heads in here, we all love tinkering. BE-505 is one of fewer than 20 flying hurricanes left in the world. And the project means sawing through part of its wooden fuselage, the section wartime technicians nicknamed the doghouse. When we actually get to, to amending the live aircraft, modifying the live aircraft, we'll start with making a cut in the doghouse uh, to remove this section so we can get a second seat in there as a second pilot or passenger. Essentially, we're taking an airworthy aircraft and making it unairworthy. It means redesigning the Hurricane's complex control system. This is the area where we will be putting the second seat. Um, and uh, at the moment, we've got the battery tray in here, the radios, an oxygen bottle. So we're going to have to relocate much of this and, and put a second seat in. They're using this mock-up as a test bed. This will be vital in the program of, of modifying the aircraft to a two-seat. Without it, we wouldn't be able to embark on the project, really, because if we make any mistakes, if we need to change anything, if we need to re-engineer something, it will all be done on this first. So before we make a cut, before we change anything on the live aircraft that can't be undone, we'll make sure that it works on this first. And there are no guarantees that once it's done, the Civil Aviation Authority will allow it to fly. 
it is a big risk, but we've got specialist design engineers involved and a great team here with more experience in the Hurricane than anyone else in the world. So, um, you know, we're, we're confident that we can do it, but, but it does pose a bit of a risk. 14 and a half thousand Hurricanes were built. In 1940, when the Battle of Britain raged in the skies over the home counties, they outnumbered the Spitfire by almost a thousand aircraft. Yet, in the newsreels, there was only one star. Tally ho! Leaving the hurricane a bit part in the war story. Even though it was responsible for 55% of the enemy planes downed by the RAF. For me, the hurricane is the unsung hero. It took a lot of punishment, it, it shot down a lot of aircraft, but other aircraft tend to get the glory. So it was working behind the scenes, doing all the graft. Andrew and his team hope to help restore the hurricane's image. And throughout the winter, the team redesign and rebuild parts of 505, untouched since she was assembled in Canada in the 1940s. It gives the team a unique insight into the terrifying reality of taking this plane to war. Some of these pilots were so young and, and had so little experience on type and then they were expected to get in them, fly them and fight a war. So really, you can't imagine what it would have been like and what they would have been feeling. It would have taken a huge amount of courage. Outclassed in air-to-air -air combat after the Battle of Britain, the Hurricane became a formidable ground attack aircraft. Armed with cannons and bombs, it was a tank buster and anti-shipping aircraft. The hurries take to the air, and it's not long before they see their target below. Sergeant John Brooks was one of those pilots. His daughter Eugenie still has his logbook. I always think it's so neat and tidy the way he's written everything out. Uh, for example, here you can see on July 23rd, 1942, he flew a bomber hurricane, uh, L, and he was up for about 35 minutes, and. During that time, he attacked the e-boats and flagships in the harbour. Sergeant Brooks flew with 174 Squadron during the disastrous Dieppe raid and against flying bomb sites in France and Holland. Pilots often had to live under canvas and fly from primitive grass airstrips. Here are my dad's flying boots. Um, they're a bit weathered now, as you can see, but these are the ones that he just took home, took them off, put them in the wardrobe and left them and they were there for at least 40 years. And then he moved in with mum. Mum wanted to throw them out, but he said, no, I'll keep them. So I've still got them now. Eugenie inherited her dad's love for speed. She became the Met's first female biker, escorting the royals and the prime minister. And then she was among the first women to carry firearms. It created a bond with her dad, who became an airline pilot after the war. He did suffer from nightmares. He'd wake up screaming. I can remember his little girl, him waking up the house screaming. He couldn't watch any of the Battle of Britain films or anything because the noise of the machine gun fire would bring it back. However, I joined the Metropolitan Police and after a couple of years, he obviously saw that I'd grown up and I'd experienced a few things myself. So he started talking to me about stuff. And I also become more aware that my dad, who couldn't work out the remote controls on the television, had flown Spitfires and Hurricanes in the war. And he was someone to be very, very proud of. In rural Suffolk, the plane Eugenie's dad flew is about to be reborn. 505 has been repainted in the markings of 174 Squadron and Sergeant Brooks' call sign, L for love. But there's still work to do. Today's job is um, fitting this brake lever to the spade grip. This is the rear spade grip and the two-seater, because we're having passengers who may just be passengers and won't be flying, we don't want them being able to operate the brakes, because that would tip the plane up on its nose. We have actually incorporated the fire button for the machine guns as part of the lock. Obviously, you know, the machine guns don't operate, but we're using this so that we can, we've got a lock-in function on the brakes. So this lever will fit onto the spade grip like this, and we can push the lock in like this, he says. And that will stop the operation of the brakes. The team have access to wartime spare parts. The rest, they must make. 
we've tried to make the aircraft as authentic as possible. So where we could use original components, we have. I, mean, I think we must be coming up to nearly 500 modified components and new components for the aircraft. We're still using the same type of machinery that they would have had during the war. Today, the team have to mill a part of the new brake lock. You see, I've done a little sketch of it with some measurements on it. And we're going to make that out of this piece of aircraft grade S80 stainless steel. So we'll go over to the lathe and machine this up. The new part must be accurate to within a thousandth of an inch. There's a spade grip. A tight fit is critical. Carefully screw it on. And there we go. It's years of practice that gets you able to turn stuff out quite quickly. That screws into there. And then the handle should slide on there, like that. Tomorrow I could be welding. The following day I may be making pipe work up for an oil system. And it's all one-off stuff. And the company is very lucky that they have all these different trades to hand on the shop floor. There isn't really any jobs which we can't tackle. There you go. Perfect. And then you get to this point of the job where it's, it's exciting because you see the plane coming together. In the cockpit, the second seat is now temporarily in place. The plane's electrical wiring system is being rerouted around the space to be taken up by a passenger. It's a small job. Once we've got this cover in place, we can then start de-clipping the rest of these new wires in place. This is the, uh, the throttle rod between the two throttles, the front and rear cockpit. So this moves backwards and forwards. And we don't want it rubbing on all of these cables. So we've got to get all these cables tucked away neat and tidy. The battle to return 505 to the skies is on schedule so far. It's September 2019, and on Elmset Airfield in Suffolk, the rebirth of Hurricane 505 has taken a big step forward. So what we have here is a two-seater Hurricane. It was, up until recently, a single-seater Hurricane, and now we've uh, converted it into a two-seat. You see in here, we've had to relocate some parts that were in the area where we wanted the second seat, so there's the batteries in there, the regulators in there, and that's where the uh, guns would have been originally. This is where the cut was made into the doghouse, uh, which is the wooden structure. Um, so what we've done is we've cut that away. We've put a second emergency door in there. You'll have full flight controls in the back, so you have ailerons, elevators, rudder. So if I move that from side to side, you'll see the front will also go at the same time. Rich is working on the brakes. Mark and Graham are finishing off the canopy and, and anything else that needs to be buttoned up before we run the engine, which you know is a big milestone for us. It means the, the aircraft's complete and really ready to go flying when the modification gets signed off. So we're, we're very excited about that. Today, the team are fitting the extended cockpit canopy, which they've designed from scratch. With a new canopy, we have two bays of glazing. Each canopy is about six inches shorter than the originals. Basically, it's the same apart from the rear of the front canopy shrouds over the top of the rear canopy so that there's air tightness between the two canopies. When the cable is pulled, it pulls the bobbin through the pin so the canopy jettisons and the pilot can then jump out of the aeroplane. It's instantaneous. Just pull the canopy back a little bit, pull the lever, give the canopy a hoof. Once the air's under it, it will just rip it off like a pair of pyjamas when you're diving in a swimming pool. A lot of complex tasks still lie ahead. Today, the team are completing work on the landing gear. I was in on Saturday and I think I spent the whole morning putting two tiny bolts in. It must support three tonnes of fighter on a shock absorber of oil and nitrogen gas. Hopefully we don't get any oil or nitrogen coming out anywhere. That's it. Turn the bottle off. 
It was designed by 1930s engineers who'd never built a retractable undercarriage before. The undercarriage is lifted with an engine-driven hydraulic pump. Obviously, in the hangar here, we can't start the engine up. So I'm going to use the, the secondary system, which is a hand pump. The hand pump would be used if a pilot lost hydraulic power from the engine, if the hydraulic pump on the engine packed up, so we can physically pump the undercarriage up and down. The pilot, while he's doing this, he can watch the undercarriage come up through the windows down here. So if you look here, you'll see the latch come up. For the Hawker Restorations team, this is a labour of love. It's been a long time coming. We've spoken about doing a two-seater hurricane for uh, many years, and now it's quite enthralling to see what we've achieved. Not every job you get to work on a piece of military machinery that, you know, is part of history. Hurricanes are the underdog, really. You know, the Spitfire. We don't really mention the Spitfire word in here. The strength of the hurricane was the design, the original tubular structure of the fuselage, uh, and then it's covered in fabric, so any bullets, if they didn't hit anything important, they would just go straight through and out the other side and not cause a problem. The main thing was to keep them flying and quick, uh, quick repairs were ideal. While generally outperformed by the Spitfire, the Hurricane could outturn its deadly enemy, the Messerschmitt 109, at some heights. German pilots often refused to believe they'd been shot down by a Hurricane. The RAF called it Spitfire snobbery. The Hurricane had to do the body of the work and it accounted for about 70% of the kills that amassed during the Battle of Britain. It was very solidly built, whereas if a Spitfire suffered damage on one of the formers because of its monocoque construction, it could possibly have been a terminal damage. But back in the hangar, the team are focused on the famous fighter's future. The first person will be the first person to fly in the back of a Hurricane in, in 70 years. Uh, will it be the only flying two-seater aircraft in the world? So it is very significant for, for us, obviously, being that the Hurricane is our, our specialty. The historic value of it and, and what it did during the war, so people will be able to actually fly in an aircraft, you know, the general public, and experience what it was like to, to fly in a Hurricane. But 505's future relies on the Civil Aviation Authority signing off one of the biggest modifications to a warbird in years. Hopefully there's nothing too bad that could go wrong if the CAA have any concerns about any of the parts we've already put in deep within the structure, that would then cause us an issue, but we don't expect it to because the stress engineers have been through it and, and they've signed it off already. If the vital approval isn't received, 505 could be grounded before its first test flight. The team are nearing the end of months of work. This stage is Hurricane 505's first big test. So it's early November and we're final preparations for having an engine run. Mark and Graham have been working on getting the aircraft finished off, the canopy on, fuel, oil, coolant, etc., and, and getting it all ready to, to run this afternoon. That'll give us a chance to check that all the systems are functioning, that we don't have oil leaks, coolant leaks, or anything else. Many of the Hurricane's vital systems lie behind removable panels. It meant servicing the plane in the field was a simple task for its ground crews. Very easy. There's only three fasteners. They'd be in and out of there every time it went up in the air and back down. They'd be opening those doors. You know, easy access. They just pop into those plates. There's a few system changes that are happening, so we'll be testing those out as well, make sure they've worked. In the grand scheme of things, they've been relatively minor, but the fact that we're running the aircraft means that it's complete, so it is one of the big milestones we've been, we've been aiming for. And another landmark has been reached. The team has just heard the Civil Aviation Authority has approved the modification, meaning 505 can fly again. But today's test may not be all plain sailing. We could have coolant leaks, could have oil leaks, could have fuel leaks. May have an issue with the generator system. And there's no reason to believe there'll be a problem with them. But you never know. <laughs> 
505 is coming to life again. So the battery is now connected, the aeroplane is live, we've got green lights to tell us that the undercarriage is down and locked. This is a generator warning light which will go out once the engine starts and we're just doing a final check now to make sure that all the electrical systems are functional. 505 is going to be pushed out into the open air for the first time since they started the conversion two years ago. The team know the engine was okay then. When we use an engine in a newly restored aircraft, it would have just gone through a full overhaul. All new parts were necessary, it was stripped down right to the bare bones and built back up again, and they're not actually run. So this one's been going for 150 hours. You know, it has been flying. So that makes life a lot easier. We know the systems work, we know the engine works. But the team are about to hit a problem. At Elmset Airfield in Suffolk, Hurricane 505's engine is about to be tested for the first time in two years. We're just tying down the tail of the aeroplane. Um, it's just in case, for some reason, the engine was to run away or overspeed, the aeroplane can tip onto its nose. So you always, as a precaution, tie down the tail. Our chief engineer, Peter Johnson, he'll be the one actually starting the aircraft up. Graham and Mark will be there with fire extinguishers at the side in case any, anything goes wrong. Once the engine starts, obviously, we're checking that there aren't any fluids coming out of the engine. Obviously, there's oil, fuel and water. Once the system's pressurised, it's always possible that something could fail. And obviously, we station people around the aeroplane to check for that because we may see it before the guy in the cockpit does. Fingers crossed, everything goes to plan. We like these to be no drama. <laughs> All clear? Clear. Clear. The Merlin is reluctant. Carburetor diaphragm could have dried out. Fuel is getting to the cylinders, clear. but not enough. Suggest we got an obstruction in a fuel pipe somewhere then, but I can't see how because the pump's pumping it through all right. Smell the burning oil. <laughs> Part of the delight of restoring old aircraft. If it was easy, everyone would do it. All right, we're going one more time. Okay, Still got a heavy drip. It could be an issue with the carburetor when they overhauled it. Um, okay, we won't know until we've investigated. It's back to the workshop. You could have had a, a major oil leak, coolant, fuel leak from somewhere. Clear this side. So, yes, it was inconvenient, but it was hardly a disaster. It's February 2020 and Hurricane 505's engine problem has been identified. The engine was, was running too lean. The fuel mixture from the carburetor wasn't correct, so we've made an adjustment and that now matches the engine, so uh, problem solved. They are now on the last stage of the restoration. It's putting the uh, spinner cone on the front. Today, another major hurdle must be cleared, the compass swing. Are you ready for us to push, Graham? Yeah. Three, two... All aircraft must, by law, have a compass to allow the pilot to navigate. Run up as far as we can, <coughs> then adjust, then we'll have a greater degree of adjustment on the next one. We're adjusting the aircraft instrument to read accurately. We want it within about three degrees, really. 
go back to you, bit, Graham. But the new metal added during the conversion is affecting the magnets in the compass. Three, two, one. Whoa! I reckon right, that'll do you. Well, we just keep checking all the points on the compass. A smidge more. I think I've got to ask about it was diametrically opposite. For Andrew, it's a frustrating operation. Back by about one degree, sorry. Okay, hold it there. That should be so. Yeah, that looks spot on, actually. All warbirds must earn their keep. Built for £4,000 in the 1940s, 505s now valued at 2.5 million. And 100 miles away in Kent, she's attracted the attention of one of the UK's biggest operators. Golf Alpha Victor, Alpha Victor begins to information Delta QNH 1017. The heritage hangar at Biggin Hill is home to the world's biggest fleet of flying Spitfires. Now, it wants to add 505 to its fleet. And 505 is in big demand. Good morning, Fly Spitfire. With customers booking to fly in the only two-seater hurricane in the world. Certainly at the moment, it's, it's all about Spitfires, and we've got more Spitfires here than we believe anywhere else in the world. But historically, obviously, the hurricane's got an amazing connection with Biggin Hill. It's not the poster boy of, of the wartime effort, but actually it did arguably more. So uh, we're super proud that, you know, we might be getting a, a two-seater version here. It's spring 2020. And at Elmset Airfield in Suffolk, it's a big day for Hurricane 505. Today is the culmination of, of 15 months of hard work, of design, engineering, problem solving, and we can't wait for it to happen. For team leader Andrew, it's been a long time coming. We've had about six to eight weeks of delay due to the weather, but we've got a bit of a gap in the weather now, so we're going to give it a go. We just push it out, sun shining. Great, it's everything we've been working for. It's going to be fantastic. And even for me, I'll actually get to go in the back of one. So, you know, I will be one of those ordinary people queuing up to sit in the back of one. So I'm very excited and, uh, and can't wait, really. Filled up with fuel and oil from all the pre flights are done, so it's OK to, to go. Veteran test pilot Stu Goldspink has flown dozens of warbirds, including single seat hurricanes. But this is a first. He'll walk around the aircraft. Just do a little pre-flight himself. They all do. Um, after that, he'll uh, he'll just launch off. Really, I've flown I think 11 of the Hurricanes flying in the world. It's about 15, I think. So I'm looking forward to this one. And hopefully, no surprises. I've never flown a two-seat Hurricane. In fact, there haven't been any in the world since the war, and they were modified in the field. So the series of flight tests that we're going to be doing uh, for about five hours will just check the handling of it and having the extra seat in the back is going to make a, a difference. Stu is taking off into the unknown. Test pilots rely on handling notes to guide them on a new plane. In this case, they don't exist. And the installation of the second seat may have fundamentally changed the way the Hurricane flies. Oh, I couldn't be prouder. They really have put in the long hours and the, and the effort to, to get this where it is today and on time. So. Yeah, very proud and very pleased. Very good, he's going well. He's, he's staying up for a fair bit of time, so he's quite happy with it. So all good so far. If he did have a problem, he'd be, he'd be back here as quickly as possible. So uh, he's up there flying around, so uh, we can only assume good things. He's probably having fun now. He you knows he's got the, the feel of it more. 505 has made it back after a 10-minute flight over Suffolk. Time for test pilot Stu to deliver his verdict. The canopy doesn't really shut. Right. And seal. Try it now. Yeah, it just has a gap in it, in the air. What else? The, no red lights to begin with, but they came up. Put the wheels down, back up again, and they came up. OK. So. Nothing to, do, oh, nothing to do there. Very hurricane line, yeah. <laughs> All went well, back safely. Couldn't ask for more. It's funny. It's funny with the seat in the back. Thank you. Do you want that? Or are you going to jump? No, I'll be right. I'll You're just jump down. Yeah. Pretty old technique. 
and I went to 240 miles an hour. So it yeah, it's fine. Yeah. The air on slide. It's nice. Same yeah, yeah. Can't tell any difference. In fact, if anything, they're slightly better. But oh. Maybe. There you go. Maybe. Couldn't have gone any better. I mean, the aircraft has taken off, landed yeah. safely. The pilot was very happy. And the handling was, was good, and he said possibly even better than it was before. So well, it just it couldn't have gone any better. We're, we're so pleased. I do a lot of two-seat Spitfire rides, and everyone loves the Spitfire. But now there's an opportunity to, to uh, love the Hurricane as well. It's September 2020, 80 years since the Battle of Britain, and at one of the UK's most iconic air bases, a lone hurricane is on her way home. 505 is reporting for duty as a passenger plane in time for what will probably be the last anniversary experienced by the survivors of the few, the fighter pilots who beat the Luftwaffe in the skies over southeast England. It's a fantastic aircraft. Uh, it is the only one in the world, the only two-seat Hurricane flying. And uh, you can see there, the aircraft is really not distinguishable from a single seat. It's just got an extra uh, part in the canopy at the rear there. Other than that, I mean, when it's actually flying, you really can't tell the difference. Can I pass this one down to you? There we go. To you. At the Heritage Hangar, the engineering team are learning the ropes of the Spitfire's less glamorous sister. Alex and Fred will be looking after 505. Oh, the conversions, yeah, it's really well done. It's really, really nice. Really, really nice job. It's certainly a different aeroplane in terms of construction and everything else with the tubular structure and all the wooden down the back. You've got to be a little bit careful where you poke your screwdriver and where you don't, and where you stand and where you don't, but on the whole, it's very nice. The snags the test flight revealed have long since been rectified, but Alex quickly finds a design flaw. Hawker's only included vital components. This is the biggest pain about bloody hurricanes, is you sit on a seat, and then below the seat in a Spitfire is a floor. On a hurricane, below the seat is some framework, some yeah. more framework. Some tubes. Some tubes. The radiator. Then the radiator and the yeah. radiator boat. And one of my friends who flies these, he grounded one for half a year because they had to take the radiator boat off to find his pencil, because he got in it to go flying and dropped his pencil. So if you don't mind me, I'm going to go find my screwdriver <laughs> in shame. All I've got to do is find the path down without getting the magnet stuck on some steel. Like I've just done. Hey, uh, now we're cooking on all burners. Right, now what I've got to do is pull it up really gently without smacking anything. And what happens is Houdini goes, here's one I found earlier, and we got one. Now that Alex has retrieved his screwdriver, 505 is ready for her first passengers. And among them is Eugenie, daughter of wartime hurricane pilot Sergeant John Brooks. We do have Spitfires, we have Hurricanes, and we, we have the 109, of course. Hangar historian Robin is about to introduce her to 505, now painted in the markings of the hurry bomber that her dad flew. <laughs> dad used to describe the Spitfire more like a thoroughbred. Yes, that's whereas true. Whereas the Hurricane was a more solid, reliable yep. a cart horse in a way, but it, it could take more punishment. How did Dad fit in there? <laughs> dad would have sat there, oh, no. obviously. Yes, yes. Obviously, because she's two seater. He would have sat there. So but how yes. original? Right. Are all the instru instruments in there. Absolutely, as it was. <gasps> so my dad could have as, touched as that. It, as it came out of the factory. Yeah, he would have been sitting Thank in you. there. It's all right. A pleasure. But he had a protocol that he would do as he hit the enemy coast. Right. And one bit, he would lower his seat. He said, "Yes." I'm not quite sure what good it did, because that was one of the few metal bits within the whole yes, hurricane. That's, Is that that's right? Yes, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's almost a living thing, isn't she? Yeah, yeah she is, really. I feel Absolutely. like I'm patting a horse almost. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Eugenie is about to take off on a once-in-a-lifetime flight in her dad's plane. She'll be flown by Anna Walker, who is one of a handful of female warbird pilots. He said the Hurricane was such a good, strong, reliable girl, as he called her, and he said that the Hurricane taught him to survive. 
There's stories of hurricanes coming back after missions, you know, looking like a sieve, you know, completely mm -hmm. shot out, you know, with control surfaces missing and all sorts of things missing, and they would still, you know, carry on flying. But obviously there'd be three of us today, there'd be you, me and Dad, so it'd be a bit of a squash, because I thought his photograph, which I'll be taking up with me. The Biggin Hill team have had to get used to operating a bigger, heavier aircraft than their Spitfires. It's the only one in the world, so it's been a learning curve, very, very different setup to the Spitfire. Eugenie is going to be flying in the skies over Kent, her father once knew so well. Hi Eugenie, can you hear me? Yes I can, hear you loud and clear. Can you see me in the mirror? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any questions? No, none whatsoever. Let's just do it. <laughs> okay. Discove Hotel Hotel India India with information India 997 request start. Discove Hotel Hotel India India begin approach started period. My hands. Le Blanc. Oh, the smell, the smell of her is gorgeous. Oh, oh my God. Sleep. What about that? <laughs> Perfect. Go for danger, ready for taxi. So the forward visibility is not brilliant, is it? No, but... On the ground? No. That's why I'm weaving from side to side. Oh, I see. Yeah, my dad said that you have to go from side to side because the nose is so high. Yeah. And oh. uh, so if you look at the rudder pad, you see the way it's, they're moving? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm using is the thing called pneumatic differential braking. Look how close to London we are. I know. There's, it's like Canary Wharf over there. Yeah. One thing that hasn't changed in 80 years is the Hurricane's vital actions list. So, pre takeoff checks, I got the trims all uh -huh. in the right place. Good. The throttle friction is tight. Mm -hmm. Mixture is on auto rich. The pitch is fully forward. And we're ready to go. Excellent. Have a great flight. Have a great flight, both of you. Yeah. Anna is flying her passenger towards the wartime airbase at Manston, where Eugenie's dad was stationed. I knew you would fly just like that. I, I knew you would just pick it up like you've done it all your life. It really is amazing. I can see it there. This is so pretty. Your dad must be so proud of you. Thank you. Okay, I have control. You have control. And you'd like me to do a big two row in your father's honor. Yes, please. Yeah. Here it is. Okay. Woo! That's nice. Right. 
It's time for 505 to return to Biggin Hill. Say goodbye. Say goodbye to your heritage. The undercarriage is going to go down now, okay? And uh, Julie, I'd like your hands and feet away from the controls now, okay? Yeah, okay. All the way. So in the India surface wind 2608 knots, this is runway 21, clear to land. Clear to land, go for this. Landing a hurricane requires pinpoint precision. And sometimes even the experts have trouble. Trust me to do my worst landing on camera. <laughs> oh, damn it. Now I can relax. <sighs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> Eugenie's friends and family have come to share her experience. It's been a flight to remember. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing to, to fly in Dad's airspace. Anna took us down to about 500 foot and we flew down Manston. Airfield with the waggly wings bit. I'm just so happy, so so happy. And there were, as I said to Anna earlier on, there were three of us up there. You know, me, Anna, and, and good old Dad. And um, there he is. <laughs> so it's brilliant. It was a man of few words. He'd nod his head and say, "Well done, girl." She's beautiful. I absolutely love her. And I can see why my dad loved the hurricane. I really can. Absolutely wonderful experience. So. Yeah. Perfect, and she flew like a dream, as I knew she would. Yeah, she flew incredibly well. Seeing a hurricane once more on the apron at Biggin Hill is equally moving for the hangar staff. I love having the hurricane back at Biggin Hill. It is such an important aeroplane for this airfield. Everyone associates with the Spitfire, understandably but it is just as important as the Spitfire, if not more. They did a, a lot of damage to the Luftwaffe, more than any of the Spitfires did. There's a lot more of them. It's, it's symbolic with this place. There was far more hurricanes here than there were Spitfires. A nostalgic flight back in time doesn't come cheap at up to 5,000 pounds an hour, but for many, it's an experience that's beyond price. A chance to fly in the slipstream of the men who took the hurricane to war. I am so very proud of my dad, but not only of my dad, but all of his mates who, who didn't come home, who died so young. <laughs>